अनिष्ठोपि दविष्ठोपि तथा अत्यंतमसन्न अपि प्रत्यक्ष इव येनास्तस्म शब्दात्मने नम रामकृष्ण नमस्कृत रामचंद्र तत पर वंदत सर्वान् आरभे वचन मह ऑन धीस पायस ऑकेजन ऑफ द नाइंटी सिक्स डेथ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ सर रामकृष्ण गोपाल भंडारकर आई वेलकम यू ऑल एज यू नो सर भंडारकर वॉज द स्टूडेंट ऑफ द फर्स्ट बैच ऑफ द बॉम्बे यूनिवर्सिटी ही सर्व एज टीचर प्रोफेसर वाइस चांसलर ऑफ द बॉम्बे यूनिवर्सिटी एंड ऑल्सो एट द डेकन कॉलेज पुणे ही वॉज अ सोशल रिफॉर्मर एंड अ ग्रेट रिसर्चर एंड he had batches of students who established this pandarkar oriental research institute on his 80th birthday that is the 6th of july 1917 it was on rishi panchami 24th of august 1925 that sir bhandarkar passed away and there after his punya tithi is celebrated by this institute on the tithi that is rishi panchami on this occasion there are several publications of the institute that are announced and for that i request professor ganesh umakant thite the general editor of the mahabharata cultural index to announce the publications friends generally on this sacred day of rushi panchami we announce new publications of the bhandarkar oriental research institute accordingly today i am going to announce two types of publications which are being published today the first two are new printed books one annals of the volume 98 number of pages 216 two mahabharata cultural index volume 3 fascicle 3 which contains the entries from arjuna 2 up to ashwatthaman in addition to these books there are some books which are of the type of reprinted and uh, they are one budha bhushana number of pages 122 history of dharma shastra volume 2 total number of pages 1558 so these are the publications which are being published today and those who are interested they may take note of it thank you very much thanks professor pite friends our speaker for today is not a person new to us he is a life member and sympathizer of the institute since last several decades professor madhav murlidhar deshpande he is the professor emeritus of sanskrit and linguistics at the michigan university ann arbor usa 
at present he is residing in california he served the michigan university as professor since 1972 he did his graduation and post graduation from the university of pune in 1966 and 68 respectively in sanskrit and then had his doctoral degree from the university of pennsylvania in 1972 his subjects of special study are sanskrit grammatical tradition historical linguistics social linguistics and religious and philosophical traditions of india hinduism and buddhism professor deshpande is also an adjunct professor at the national institute of advanced studies at bangalore and recently he is appointed as a senior fellow at the oxford center of hindu studies professor deshpande has published 15 books and has to his credit over 150 research papers relating to the areas that i mentioned previously he is a visiting scholar at the department of linguistics stanford university and has delivered several learned lectures at several universities and colleges his today's topic is also very interesting the oriental debate and the responses from the orient i thank him in advance and i also thank our it team nyansa for their cooperation in this work we are eager to hear professor deshpande and now over to him thank you greetings from california uh, this is good morning to you and it's still evening for me at the very outset let me begin by thanking the mandalkar oriental research institute for inviting me to deliver this mandalkar death anniversary address i have spent a good deal of my time conducting research at this institute and i consider it to be my home away from home today i shall speak to you on the topic of the orientalism debate and the responses from the orient and i shall mainly focus on the contributions of sir arjay bhandarkar and justice mahadev govind ranade let me first explain to you the history of the term orient the term orient to refer to the asiatic world to the east of europe has a long history and it marks a division between the east and the west not only in geography and culture but also in the power balance especially during the long period of colonialism as the english rule gradually spread throughout india the east india company began debating its education policy whether the education of the indian subjects should be conducted in english or whether the company should promote oriental education the english officials at that time were split between the camps of so called orientalists and anglicists in the early days of the company the promoters of the oriental education remained dominant and this led to the establishment of company sponsored institutions like the pune 
संस्कृत पाठशाला द कलकत्ता संस्कृत कॉलेज द बनारस संस्कृत कॉलेज एंड द वेरियस मुस्लिम मद्रासाज इन द एरियाज कंट्रोल बाय द कंपनी विद इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ अर्ली मॉडर्न इंडिया दिस सीम्स टू बी द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द यूज ऑफ द टर्म ओरिएंटल which originally referred to the teaching of the hindu traditions to the hindus and the islamic traditions to the muslims in the domain of the east india company gradually this term spread to the western study of the orient as numerous organizations like the american oriental society the deutsche morgenlandischen gesellschaft the german oriental society and the international congress of orientalists popped up all over the western world in india as well the term oriental came to be used to refer to modern approaches to the study of india that were derivative of this western use of this term and the name of the bhandarkar oriental research institute is a case in point sir rg bhandarkar was among one of the indian scholars to attend the session of the international congress of orientalists held in 1886 in vienna journals of oriental research and various oriental institutes and the all india oriental conference was set up in various parts of colonial india along with branches of the royal asiatic society in places like calcutta and mumbai this oriental research in the modern or western mode was explicitly set up in contrast with the study of the tradition in older institutions like the sanskrit pathshala in 1972 i myself received my phd degree at the department of oriental studies of the university of pennsylvania in philadelphia this department was established many decades earlier but it was subsequently replaced by various other departments under the new rubric of south asian studies south east asian studies etc this change in the name from oriental studies came about in 1992 after a year long dispute as the new york times reported on june 16 1991 and i quote some students largely members of the university's asian community assert that the current name oriental studies is a racist name connoting an exotic society whose people are submissive however several older institutions carrying the word oriental are still functioning in the us and elsewhere the academic critique of the term oriental had already begun in the us prior to 1991 in 1978 edward said a professor at columbia university in new york published an important book titled orientalism which started a critical discussion of western studies of the orient the colonial motivations behind that study the impact of the western conceptions of the orient in how the west administered the orient and how the orient responded to this under colonial circumstances this book initiated a long back and forth debate on this issue that has continued through 
many iterations. In this debate, as it concerns the study of ancient India, Professor Wilhelm Halfas of University of Pennsylvania published his book, India and Europe, an essay in understanding in 1990, which was focused on Europe's understanding of India through its long history. His book also has spawned a long chain of further studies, some of them critiquing various forms of Orientalism, including British colonialism and the Aryanism of the Nazi ideology in Germany, and how these developments affected the perceptions of the Orient in different ways. In 1996 volume titled Beyond Orientalism, Essays on Cross-Cultural Encounter, edited by Fred Dahlmeier, includes important studies of Orientalism and reactions to it, and the 2007 volume of almost the same title, Beyond Orientalism, edited by Elie Franco and Karin Preisendanz, evaluates the work of Wilhelm Halfas and its impact on Indian and cross-cultural studies. Besides these, there are numerous publications continuing this multi-directional investigation. An extension of these studies is seen in subaltern studies and post-colonial studies of the Indian subcontinent. In these critical studies of Orientalism, primarily Western scholars are talking among themselves about Western approaches to the Orient, critiquing the history of these Western approaches, but the voice of the Orient itself is rarely heard in these discussions. In these studies, the agency of Orientalism is put squarely on the shoulders of the Western scholars and colonial administrators, and the Oriental is generally perceived as the meek recipient of this Western colonial dispensation with no agency of his own. Recently, several approaches opposing Western Indology for various reasons are making their voices heard, both from diasporic Indians and scholars in India. All these debates are raging as we speak, but I do not wish to recount these modern debates. In my presentation today, I want to look for the agency of the Indian subjects of British India in formulating their responses to what may be broadly called Western Indology of the 18th and the 19th centuries. I shall argue that while the inputs to various ideas came from the West, the Indians recast the received Western ideas and ideologies to their own understandings and their own purposes. These Indian understandings and purposes had often little or no connection with the Western origins of these ideas. The developments of the Western ideas in the Indian intellectual world took different directions, and this is due to the agency of the Indian thinkers. Orientalism, as it was received and developed in India, is an appropriate topic to consider while delivering this lecture at the invitation of the Vandarkar Oriental Research Institute. On this occasion, as 
illustrations, I shall focus on the contributions of Sir R.J. Bhandarkar and Justice Mahadev Govinda Ranade. Uh, these are only two illustrations. The same study can be extended to other scholars and thinkers of that time. Let us look at the situation as it existed prior to Bhandarkar and Ranade in Maharashtra. As the British took over the rule of this region from the Peshwas in 1818, the colonial authorities initially began sponsoring educational efforts both for traditional Sanskritic learning and vernacular languages. The support for exclusively traditional Sanskrit learning first emerged in the form of the British setting up a Sanskrit Parshala in Pune, providing for the study of traditional Sanskritic subjects. Here, the British authorities attempted to de-emphasize the Vedic studies and encouraged the Shastric studies, particularly the fields of astronomy, mathematics, and law, hoping that this would gradually push the traditional community of Brahmins in more rational and useful directions. Increasingly, over the next few decades, the British were dissatisfied with the management of the Sanskrit Parshala in Pune. The Sanskrit Parshala was eventually closed and the British authorities gradually transformed it into a modern college, the Deccan College, in 1860. It was this college where modernity and Western knowledge first made a major entrance into the consciousness of the Brahman and non-Brahman communities in Pune. While the first half of the 19th century saw the emergence of modernizing Brahmins like Bal Shastri Jambekar, a more serious turn in the direction of modern education and dissemination of Western ideas began with the establishment of the Deccan College in Pune and institutions like the Elphiston College in Mumbai. After Bharashastri Jambhekar, who is generally considered to be the first Brahman promoter of modern education in the vernacular language, there appeared several Brahmins who carried forward the torch of modern education. Among these early efforts, we must count the figures of Bhav Daji Lad, Kashinath Trambak Telang, Ramkrishna Gopal Bhandarkar, and Mahadev Govinda Ranade. They constitute a generation of modern Brahmins that dominated the field of modern historical and Indological studies in the second half of the 19th century, and they trained later generations of native scholars like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Vishnu Shastri Chiprunkar, and Mahadev Moreshwar Kunte. Bhavdaji, Telang, Bhandarkar, and Ranade were nationalists and yet were political moderates who saw the benefits of British education and governance toward the emergence of modernity in India. Ramkrishna Gopal Bhandarkar, born in 1837, played a crucial role in the transition of Sanskrit education in Maharashtra to modernity. He was born in a Saraswat Brahman family in Malwan on the Konkan coast. After completing his early education in an English language school at Ratnagiri, he matriculated from the Elphiston 
high school in Bombay in 1854 and was awarded BA in 1858. With the award of a Dakshina Fellowship, he joined the Pune College, the precursor of Deccan College, and received his MA degree in Sanskrit in 1863. After Professor Kielhorn retired from Deccan College in Pune, Bhandarkar was appointed in his place in 1882, where he taught until he retired in 1893. Bhandarkar was the first fully modern Indian professor who did not come from a Pandit background and acquired Sanskrit through institutions like the Deccan College and its precursor, the Pune College. In the diagram of Guru Shishya lineages, Kashina Shastri Abhyankar records Kiel Horn to be the disciple of Ananta Shastri Pindharkar, while Bhandarkar is recorded as a disciple of Kiel Horn. In his presidential address at the first All India Oriental Conference held at Pune, in 1919, Bhandarka refers to two classes of learned men. And I quote Bhandarka. He says, There are the pandits of the old school who have spent long years in studying in a traditional way the authoritative Sanskrit texts of different branches of Sanskrit learning, such as Vyakarana and Nyaya. Their studies, exclusively confined to particular branches, are no doubt deep and sound, but they are lacking in historical and comparative and critical outlook. But then there are those scholars who have been studying the literature of the country and the inscriptions and antiquities scattered in different provinces by the application of the historical, comparative, and the critical method. Bhandarkar obviously belonged to the second category. Bhandarkar's explicit departure from the traditional Sanskritic modes of thought in the direction of the contemporary critical scholarship from Germany may be seen in his suggestions for research on the Veda. He says, The text of the Rig Veda, there is reason to suppose, is not quite the same as it was originally. Some suktas and ruks are found in the other Vedas, and there the readings in some cases are different. What the original readings were, will have to be determined, if at all possible, by comparing the variation and taking a good many other facts into consideration. The way has been shown by Oldenberg and it is quite open to any of us to follow it. <laughs> In some ways, Bhandarkar went much further than his European mentor, Professor Kielhorn, in modernizing the teaching of Sanskrit for the newly emerging schools and colleges in Maharashtra. In 1870, Kielhorn's A Grammar of the Sanskrit Language was published at the request and under the patronage of the public director of public instruction in the presidency of Bombay. And Kilhorn says that this book is intended principally for Indian students. It contains as much of the Sanskrit accidents as is necessary for the ordinary BA examination. Those who look higher 
Kilhan says, I refer to the Siddhanta Kamudi and other indigenous works on grammar, without a careful study of which his scholar-like knowledge of the Sanskrit language appears to me unattainable. However, while Kilhan produced an excellent reference grammar, it was not very useful for teaching Sanskrit. The first successful modern teaching grammar was produced by Bhandarkar, namely his first book of Sanskrit and his second book of Sanskrit. These books were published six years prior to the grammar of by Kilhorn, who interestingly was Bhandarkar's teacher. In the preface to the first edition of his first book of Sanskrit, dated March 1864, Bhandarkar who was only 25 years old at this time, narrates the then current situation of Sanskrit education and the need for a new method of teaching Sanskrit. Bhandarka says, The study of Sanskrit has but recently risen in the estimation of the educated natives of this presidency and of our educational authorities. The old Sanskrit College of Pune owed its existence and continuance rather to a spirit of conciliation and toleration in our British rulers than to their conviction of the utility of Sanskrit as a branch of general education. The modern critical and progressive spirit was not brought to bear upon it. The old Shastris in that Pune Parshala were allowed to carry all things in their own way. After about 30 years since its establishment, the authorities began to exercise active interference until at length the Sanskrit Parshala was abolished and a new system inaugurated. This newly awakened and more enlightened zeal in favor of Sanskrit cannot last or produce extensive results unless books are prepared to facilitate the general study of that language. Bhandarka says that Sanskrit would be considerably more easy than it is if there were men educated in our English colleges to teach it, and if books specially adapted for beginners were available. Andarka's books were meant to meet this need. From all accounts, as teaching tools, Bhandarkar's books were enormously popular and successful. They underwent more than 35, 36 reprints. They were in fact so popular that they were quickly translated into Marathi to meet the needs of those modern students who went to Marathi schools. Vinayak Narayan Shastri, who was a Sanskrit teacher at a school in Bombay translated Bhandarkar's first book of Sanskrit into Marathi and its translation was supervised by Bhandarkar himself. In the Sanskrit preface to the second edition of this Marathi translation, published in 1878, Vinayak Narayan Shastri says that there were no appropriate books to teach Sanskrit in Marathi. This need is now fulfilled by this translation of Bhandarkar's books. It is important to note that if Shastri was persuaded to make available Bhandarkar's modern method of teaching Sanskrit in Marathi schools. 
Bhandarka's contribution toward an understanding of the Aryan origins may be seen most profoundly in his Wilson Philological Lectures on Sanskrit and the Derived Languages, delivered in 1877 in Bombay. In his introductory remarks, Bhandarka refers to his departure from the traditional Sanskritic modes of thought and the precarious position he had reached among his contemporaries. And I quote Bhandarka, A Shastri or Pandit is esteemed and treated with respect and consideration by his countrymen. The English knowing Indian may be feared if he holds some government appointment, but if none, he enjoys no consideration. In one branch of learning, however, namely Sanskrit, an English knowing Indian may meet with appreciation and esteem at the hands of the learned in Europe. Among his own countrymen, he will find sympathy only if he has studied Sanskrit exactly the old way. But even in this case, his heterodoxy, which is the result of his English education, would stand in his way. But there are indications that a more sympathizing and appreciating body of men is growing about us, and the circle will go on widening as education advances. This is the best description of the predicament of the emergence of modernity in Indian education at that time. This modernity and its predicament are here to stay with us in the reception of the new theories of Aryan origins in this region that developed in the 19th and the 20th centuries in Maharashtra. Referring to the developments in historical and comparative linguistics, since the days of Sir William Jones, Bhandarkar says, and I quote, The discovery of Sanskrit and the Indian grammatical system at the close of the last century led to a total revolution in the philological ideas of Europeans. But several circumstances had about this time prepared Europe for independent thought in philology. The languages of Europe, ancient and modern, were compared with Sanskrit and with each other. This led to comparative philology and the classification of languages and a comparison of the words and forms in the different languages led scholars into the secrets of the growth of human speech and the science of language was added to the list of existing branches of knowledge. The progress made within about 50 years is marvelous and affords a striking instance of the intellectual activity of the Europeans. In the cultivation of philology and the elaboration of this new science, the Germans of all other nations have been most prominent and have done by far the greater portion of the work. Bhandarkar openly acknowledges his debt to this new European philology and is consequently advocating views on Indian history, Indian linguistic history, which come as a serious departure from the traditional Indian views. While his Wilson philological lectures were specifically focused upon Sanskrit and the derived languages and not on the Indo-European prehistory of Sanskrit, 
Bhandarkar acknowledges the essential validity of the construction of the Indo-European language family and the place of Sanskrit within this family. I quote Bhandarkar, the languages of the civilized nations of the world have been divided into three families, the Aryan or Indo-European, the Semitic and the Turanian. Bhandarkar then gives a detailed description of languages belonging to various branches of Indo-European family, including the Indian branch consisting of Sanskrit, Pali and the Prakrits and the modern vernaculars of Northern India and Ceylon. The very historical approach to the study of Sanskrit, not just its prehistory, is a new development in the days of Bhandarkar. With a new historical approach to the study of Sanskrit grammarians, Bhandarkar asserts, and I quote, It therefore appears clear to me that the language in Panini's time was different from that condition in which it was in Katayana's time. In Panini's time, a good many words and expressions were current, which ceased to be used in Katayana's time, and some grammatical forms were developed in the time of the latter, which did not exist in Panini's time. For Indian intellectuals of the 19th century Maharashtra, the notion that the prehistory of Sanskrit related to languages like Persian, Greek, and Latin, and that Sanskrit itself had a changing history of its own, were indeed revolutionary ideas. These ideas remained revolutionary for quite some time in Maharashtra and did not attain universal acceptance. Bhandarkar, in examining the relationship between Sanskrit and Pali, begins to develop historically oriented explanations. And I quote, Though the speakers of Pali heard conjunct consonants and the diphthongs I and Au pronounced by the speakers of Sanskrit as correctly as the other letters which they did not corrupt, their organs were not fitted to utter them. These peculiarities may have been natural or acquired. If natural, the people who first corrupted Sanskrit into Pali must have belonged to an alien race which came into close contact with the Aryas and learnt their language. The process of the emergence of the Prakrits is accounted for by Vandarkar by referring to the migration of the Aryas from the land of the five rivers to the country known afterwards as Brahmavarta and Kurukshetra. This is the country where, in Bhandarkar's words, the Aryas formed a consolidated community in which an aboriginal or alien race was incorporated and the language represented by Pali was the language of that race. The idea of the Aryas, the speakers of Sanskrit, meeting non-Aryas and such a contact leading to a degenerative transformation of Sanskrit into Prakrits is an idea not inherently alien to the Sanskritic tradition. For example, in Bhartrughari's words, Rujisham etad vacho yat apabramsha. Apabramsha is like the discarded excrement of vach. And Katyayana and Patanjali attribute the origin of Apabramsha to the ashakti of speakers. 
But the same Sanskrit tradition does not admit any notion of history for this language which is perceived to be divine and eternal. And here, Bhandarkar's efforts to find historical origins of and developments in Sanskrit did not go well with his contemporaries. If the transformations of Sanskrit into Pali were caused by the alien speakers trying to learn the Aryan language, what was it that caused the transformations which resulted into the very existence of Sanskrit itself and what caused transformations within the very history of Sanskrit? Such questions indeed raised very difficult issues for Bhandarkar. And his own wording suggests that he was kind of caught in the middle. Bhandarkar's wording would suggest a belief that the Aryas were not in contact with non Aryas in the land of the five rivers. Now, even admitting that the Indus civilization was discovered after Bandarka's time, one still finds this belief difficult to accept, particularly because there are northwestern Prakrits in Ashokan inscriptions, a fact that was clearly known to Bandarka. Bandarka finds that the northwestern Prakrits like Paishachi appear to be truly Aryan. Perhaps then this was the language of an Aryan tribe, he says, that had remained longer in the original seat of the race and immigrated to India at a late period and settled on the borders. Or it may have been a tribe that came to India along but lived in a sort of mountainous uh, area and independence. And therefore, their language did not undergo some of the phonetic modifications which Sanskrit underwent in the mouth of the Aboriginal races. So, Paishachi Prakrit was seen as not having undergone uh, such changes because of contact with non aryan So, the speakers of Northwestern Prakrit were deemed to be truly Aryan by Vandarkar, uncontaminated by contact with non aryans Vandarka seems to believe that Aryans were not in contact with any Aboriginal races until they moved out of the land of five rivers and reached the middle of North India. The notion that the ancestors of the Vedic Aryans came to India from outside was obviously acceptable to Vandarka. Referring to the Mitanni inscriptions in Anatolia dated to 1400 BC, Vandarka points out the proximity of the Mitannis to Assyrians. He connects the Assyrians with the Asuras of the Vedas. He says that the Atharva Veda puts the Dasyus and the Asuras together and he comments, it is not unlikely that just as in India, the progress of the Aryans was contested by the Dasyus, so was it contested by the Asuras of Assyria. And they were thus compared with the Dasyus in some passages of Atharva Veda that he quotes. In his lecture, given in 1888 at the Free Church College in Mumbai, Bhandarkar expresses his complete support for the critical, comparative and historical method. And I quote, the critical, comparative and historical methods began to be well understood and employed about the end of the 18th century and within a hundred years since that time, an equally amazing progress has been made. Bhandarkar was, 
a political moderate and though a nationalist, he saw the benefits brought to India by the British rule and especially the modern education. Even while appreciating the contribution of the Europeans in the development of modern knowledge, Bhandarkar wanted Indians not to lag far behind. He says, why should discoveries be made only in France, Germany and England and not in India? Surely no costly laboratories are required to enable us to study the ancient literature of our own country. This is a field in which we may successfully compete with Europeans and in which we enjoy certain peculiar advantages. Bhandarkar was fond of referring to the leading Western Indologists as Rushis. I quote, he says, Let us, sitting at the feet of the English, French and German Rushis, imbibe the knowledge that they have to give and at least keep pace with them, if not try to go beyond them. Bhandarkar's liberal political views, his active participation in the movement for social reform and his open-ended academic approach were not easily palatable to many of his contemporaries, including many who were almost his students like Vishnu Shastri, Chiprunkar and Bal Gangadhar Tilak. However, despite the tensions between them and Bhandarkar, they had deep respect for Bhandarkar. It is evident that the roots of modern education were planted in the soil of Pune firmly. Tilak obviously went on to develop exciting new ideas about the original home of the Aryas. And certainly Bhandarkar's ideas were a source of knowledge for Lokmanya Let us briefly look at the views of Justice Mahadev Govinda Ranadi. A contemporary of Bhandarkar and a participant in the social and religious reform movements and liberal politics was Justice Ranadi. Ranadi's historical work focuses more on the period of the Maratha kingdoms. Though one sees his treatment of ancient history in some of his writings. In his introduction to Mr. C. V. Vaidya's book, one finds some elaborate references to the period of the ancient Aryas. Here, Ranade is mainly concerned with issues related to social reform, and yet he is making his statements about the need for social reform in the context of reviewing the ancient history of social institutions. Let me quote Ranade. There is abundant reason for hope that an historical study of these institutions will dispel many a false conception of the antiquity and sanctity of the existing arrangements. In his presentation of the need for reform of the Hindu social practices like child marriage and the ban on widow remarriage, Ranade points out the similarities of practices among the Hindu Aryas and the Roman Aryas. Again, I quote Ranade. The rise and fall of female rights and the status in Hindu Aryan society has a history of its own, at once interesting and suggestive in its analogies to the corresponding developments in the institutions of another kindred stock, the Roman Aryans, who have 
so largely influenced European ideas. Both began by a complete subordination of the women in the family to the men and of the men themselves to the head of the family. Here, Ranade accepts the bond of common ancestry between the Hindu Aryas and the Roman Aryas, something that was common knowledge for his Western educated generation. Ranade likes to argue that the ideals of social reform were already practiced by the ancient Aryas during some pure ancient period. However, a decay set in due to the conflicts of the Aryas with the non Aryas. Ranade would like to believe in a sort of initial ideal golden period of the ancient Aryas when they were practicing a sort of modern morality and were politically united. All this came to an end through internal demoralization as well as Ranade says through the external attacks by the non aryas This was compounded by the degradation which occurred during the rule of the Muslims. Ranade looks upon the British rule as a golden opportunity to return to the ancient ideals of the pure Aryas. Ranade looks upon the social customs of the modern British as continuities from the common ancestral Aryan period, unaffected by barbarous laws and patriarchal notions. And the newly found association of the British Aryans with the currently degraded status of Indian Aryans as an opportunity for the degraded Indian Aryans to go back to their ancient glory. Here, the political use of history gets more and more complicated. The British Aryans, as designated by Ranade, faced different demands from different groups in India. Were they supposed to Aryanize the Indian non Arya and re Aryanize the Indian Aryans as Ranade expected? Or were they supposed to save the non Aryan Indian from the domination of the Indian Aryans as Jyotiba Phule famously demanded? Before I conclude this discussion of the 19th century theories about Aryans, their migrations, etc., I would like to point out a major factor besides the emerging nationalism of that time. The participants in this discussion were not neutral personalities. Their own identities were directly involved in the development of their theories. The social identity of Bandarkar, Ranade, Kunte, Chiprunkar, and Tilak as Brahmins has as much to contribute to the shape of their theories as the non Brahman identity of Jyotiba Pule and his life experiences contributed to the shape of his series. The advocacy of a certain point of view in the cause of self identity and interest is manifest in the writings of many personalities discussed and referred to above. Is this avoidable? I do not believe so. There is, in reality, no entirely neutral historical writing completely divorced from the identity and the life experience of the historian. This is precisely where we notice the innovative agency of these recipients of Western Orientalism in India. Coming back to the Orientalism debate, while it is quite appropriate 
for Western scholars to look at the causes and forms of Western Orientalism and its impact on the Orient and on the West itself. We need not look at the recipients of this Western Orientalism in the Orient as meek, passive receivers. The Oriental recipients have molded that Orientalism to their own purposes and a study of how this has happened makes us aware of the innovative agency of these recipients in the Orient and now particularly in India. Finally, I want to thank the authorities of the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Thank you all for listening to me. Thank you.